Today we are going to do some practical shell scripting. What do I mean by that? Most of my tutorials, I try to show you how tools work and things you can do with it, but people go, well, how do I use that in the real world with scripts I'm writing? And the answer is, I don't know, because I don't know what you're trying to do. Uh, programming is problem solving. You have an issue, uh, usually something you want to automate and you want to script it out and you need to figure out how to do that. Uh, and so I show you these little bits and pieces that you should put together, but I figure why not just make up a scenario and, and we will try to, you know, write out a shell script that does this. And what we're going to do is we're going to grab the titles in this video of a YouTube video based on the URL, okay? Now I'm aware that there's a program out there that does lots of stuff about getting information and other things from YouTube. I'm not even gonna say the name of it because anytime I mention it in a video, I get a strike on my channel. But we're gonna do it manually, okay? So here, I'm at, here I am at filmsbychris.com. That's Chris the K, there is a link in the description. My website, you can search through all my videos here. And I'm just gonna choose one here. I'm gonna click on this one here and I'm gonna pause the video once it starts up, blah, 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 wait for it to load, okay. Pause that. Okay, I'm gonna grab the URL from this channel. And I am gonna use wget, but you can use curl. So I'm gonna say, uh, you know, wget. Now if I just do that, it's going to download the HTML from that page to a file, but I don't wanna do that. I'm gonna say dash Q for quiet, so I don't see the progress or information about the download. And I'm gonna say dash, or not dash O, but I'm gonna say dash Q and then a capital O, that's the letter O, not a zero, dash. That's gonna just dump the output to the current uh, screen. Haha, <laughs> that's a lot of stuff. Now, what I'm going to do is, is you know, go through all that. Now we know the title of this, this video is uh, tutorial compilation. Okay. is part of the name. So what I can do in here is I can take that same command and then pipe it into grep. By, by the way, this is an intermediate video. I kind of assume that you know how these basic tools work, but hopefully if not, you'll, you'll learn something, but grep is just going to say, Hey, in all that output, look for these words. So I'm going to do that. But the thing is a lot of stuff is all on one line. So I get a lot of blah, blah, blah here. So what I'm going to do is before I do the grepping, I am going to pipe it into uh, TR. You can also use said, but I'm going to say, find all the commas and make them new line characters and then find the line that says tutorial compilation. Okay. That helps a little bit there. So we're looking through here and uh, there's one right there. And we have one right here. So we have this one that says title, title. And there we go. There's our title right there. That's one option. So let's see if we can find that. So uh, we can see this line starts with title inside quotations, colon, and then quotation mark, right? This other line starts the same thing, but doesn't have that quotation mark there. So let's try grepping for that. So we will erase this and try to put this on a line so you can see it like so. So I use single quotes because there's regular quotes in there. I'm gonna do that and lo and behold, we do get a bunch of stuff returned. And it looks like the first one here is the title of this video. And then there's other words that have to, oh, you know what I did, didn't do? Uh, so this is finding all instances of that. What I wanna do is right here, add the little caret symbol. And that's gonna say lines that start with quotation marks, title, quotation marks, colon, quotation mark. And there we go, we have our title. Let's go ahead and use the cut command and say, okay, look at the quotation marks and give us the fourth column. We have the title of the video. Now we need to make sure that this works against other videos. So let's go back to my Films by Chris. I'm gonna copy the URL from this video and I'm going to replace the URL here with the URL video there. And we'll run that and it says, Bill Do Nukem, 3D on Linux, and that was the name of that video. Let's grab another one. We're going to uh, copy the link address, and in here we will replace it. Once we've tested on a few, we will then throw this into a script. There we go. So this seems to work. This right now will get us to the, you were scraping it. So as long as they don't change the format of the page, which they could do at any point, this should work. So let's go ahead and just highlight that and let's start making a script. I'm gonna use, uh, well, actually I'm using NeoVim, but I have it alias to Vim, but I'm gonna be using a Vim variant uh, to write my script and I'll just call it YouTube titles.sh, okay? And I'm gonna say bin bash here at the top. This is saying this is a bash script and I will paste in that right there and I will save it and exit and I will say, make that executable. And I'll say this and voila, it gives us the title of that video. But of course, that just gives us the title of the one video. Let's go in here 
And what we're going to do is I will uh, delete in these tags and I will say dollar sign URL. And I'm going to say URL equals our first argument. So now I can say YouTube uh, titles and I can copy one of these videos. So let's go ahead and copy this URL and I will paste that in there and it gives us the title of that video. Perfect. But you know, what if, what if you don't give it anything, right? We're, we're probably going to either get an error or no output, no output. Uh, so we should do some checks. Okay. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to say, okay, dollar sign one. Okay. If that does, does exist, I'm going to say the variable URL equals that first argument. If it does not, I can say read dash P please enter video URL and I will say URL. So what's saying here is, okay, check. If there's an argument, then make the variable URL equals that argument. If not, ask for the URL. So now we'll save that. We'll run this. I didn't give it a URL, so I will copy one from here. Copy link, paste it in there. Great. And of course, if I do give it a URL, let's give it a different URL. Copy. It shouldn't ask for it because it sees you gave it one. But what if you give it a URL that isn't a YouTube URL? So, and also, what if you just want to use what's in the clipboard? I like doing that a lot. I like having, you know, checking for user input. If there's no input, check the clipboard. If there's nothing in the clipboard or not the right thing in the clipboard, then ask for it. So let's go back in here and see if we can write this a little differently. So if URL, if uh, the first argument exists, we're going to say, set the URL variable to that argument. Then I'm going to say, if that fails, then I'm going to say URL, oops, put that on the new line. I'm going to say URL equals, and for me, I like using Xclip. Now this may not be, you know, when you're sharing a script with somebody, you, you have to either make a package manager or have your script check. I'm using Xclip, which is not installed by default on all systems, but should be in the repositories. So right here, I'm not going to go into too depth with this script, uh, but you would want to do a check to see if Xclip exists. And if not, then there's a, was it XS, Xselect or X? S-E-L, I don't know, I don't use it. There are different ways to get stuff from the clipboard. And if you're on Termux, you can use Termux-clipboard or something like that. Okay, so here we're going to say that. And then, so we're looking for an argument, saying the URL to that. If that, if we don't pass an argument, we're gonna check the clipboard. Next, we're gonna say, okay, uh, dollar sign one, if it does not equal HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash Y, and anything past that. I think this is the proper way to write this. Okay, so if it does not, then we are going to say to ask for a URL. Okay, so we're here, we're either getting it from the user input, we are checking the clipboard if that does not exist, and then we're saying, okay, now that we have a URL, is it actually a URL that, um, at least starts with why, because I say why because uh, here we're using youtube.com, but if you actually select uh, the share link, it's actually shorter. So share here, it's going to be, I guess I could go you because it's utu.be. So let's do that. Let's just go. So as long as it starts with you, okay? So let's go ahead and we'll copy something that is not and I will run my script here and I will not pass it an argument and it should ask me for a URL yes so now I can copy this URL paste it in there and I got the title now if I was to run it and I was to copy this one let's see websites as Android apps copy that we will paste it in here Oh, nope, I did something wrong because it should. Oh, www, see, we have we could have a check multiple variants. I'm just gonna leave it as, make sure it's a URL, okay? Okay, so that time it looked at this, it saw that I passed it something and it has HTTPS. Now, if I was to do this, it's gonna ask me for it because it doesn't start with HTTPS. And then finally, I could go, uh, copy this URL and not pass it anything. 
but it should see, ah, see, it didn't work. Uh, let's see, X clip dash O. Okay, it should have worked. I typed something wrong. This is part of the learning process. Okay, we're saying, okay, is there an argument? If so, set that to that. And then here we're saying URL equals this. And then we're saying, okay, oh, that's the problem. This should be URL because we've set the URL. Okay, now let's run it and it should check my clipboard. Let's make sure I have a URL selected. There we go, and I check my clipboard. So we have those three different options. You can pass it an argument. It will, if you don't pass an argument, it will check your clipboard. If your clipboard matches at least HTTPS, it will use that. If neither of those th things work, it will ask for a URL, and then it will give you the title. So that, I think, is pretty good. We have three lines of code and a pretty good, I think, script here. So now we can use it however. So I hope you found this useful. Uh, I hope you learned some things. So again, uh, this is kind of an intermediate vi immediate video, which uh, I mentioned a few minutes in the video. I should have said right off the bat. So hopefully you understand some of this. But yeah, here we're just checking. Are we passing something? If so, use that. If not, check the clipboard. So again, xclip. xclip can put stuff in the clipboard or show you what's in the clipboard. So as I showed you, if you do xclip dash lowercase o, it shows you what's in your clipboard currently. Um, and then here we're checking, okay, if it's not a URL, then ask for a URL. And then we will continue. Um, no, oh, you know what we should actually do is, again, uh, check. Does URL have HTTPS in it? If not, then we should exit. Uh, and you can exit one with an error if you want to count that as an error. Um, so now, if I run our script... Uh, right, it's going to ask for something, and if I give it something that's not a URL or uh, just gibberish like this, it will exit. You could, you know, set it up to give a message or something, but it's just kind of canceling out, right? So yeah, that uh, that would be the last part for that. So we added now we have four lines of code, uh, and I think uh, that this could be pretty useful. You know, if not just for. Um, getting the titles of YouTube videos, but if you're scraping websites, these four lines could be in your script all the time for making sure that a URL is passed in some way, right? So I thank you for watching. Films by Chris.com, that's Chris with a K. There's a link in the description. As always, I thank you for watching. Please visit my website, my Patreon page. Think about supporting in the support section on my website. There's links to everything in the description of the video. And as always, have a great day. Today we're going to be talking about running Linux completely from RAM. What do I mean by that? So when you're running a live distro of Linux, either off a USB flash drive, a CD or a DVD, or even an image off a hard drive, that thing is running in RAM. That thing, that distro is running in RAM, but it's pulling information off that disk, whether it's the CD or flash drive. So everything's loaded to RAM as you use it, but as you're requesting files off the distribution, it's coming from the disk, which nowadays, you know, off a flash drive, especially reading at least is fairly fast. But especially back in the day when it came to CDs and DVDs, it could be fairly slow. So if you can load the whole thing to RAM, it's faster. Also a benefit of running everything out of RAM is normally when you boot off a USB flash drive or a CD, you got to leave that disk in the computer. Well, if you boot everything to RAM, you can take the, the USB flash drive or CD out and the whole thing will still run. You don't need that drive in there anymore, which is nice. So we have speed as a benefit. We have the benefit of not having the disk in the system, but also if you're really paranoid, you could have a diskless system where you just have the RAM. So normally when you're running off a USB flash drive, uh, lots of times it's a read only image. So nothing's being written to the disk unless you set up some sort of um, persistent mode. But if you really want to make sure that nothing is being saved to that drive, having no drives in the computer is nice. Everything's written to RAM, so as soon as you turn off the computer, you know that everything's going to be cleared out. So what are the downsides to booting to RAM? Well, one, longer boot time, because you got to wait for the entire image to be copied to RAM. So if you have a distro that's a gig or two gigs, depending on the speed of the flash drive and your computer, it might add 30 seconds, a minute, or even two minutes to the boot time as it loads everything to RAM. Another downside is if you're limited on RAM, you're now using up a lot more of your RAM as disk space. So let's space. say you have four gigs of RAM and you have a distribution that the image is two gigs. Well, you just used half of your RAM 
just to load up your system. Now you're only running with two gigs worth of RAM, which, especially if you're downloading stuff, could fill up fairly quickly. Because remember, you're not using a hard drive, you're running from RAM. So that's a downside, especially, you know, working with older machines. Now, some distributions automatically boot to RAM, especially lightweight distributions. Uh, I believe Puppy Linux does, uh, DSL does, that's darn small Linux, we'll say that. Um, another one is Slitaz Linux. How do you pronounce Slitaz? How to pronounce dot com. Sleetaz. Sleetaz? Slitters. Slitters? That doesn't sound right. Ooh, how to pronounce dot com forward slash French. I think it's a French distro. Sleetaz. 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 Ooh, the official forums for Slitaz. How to say Slitaz? Slitaz is an acronym. It is, I had no clue, for simple, lightweight, incredible, temporary, autonomous zone? Is that really what it stands for? I had no clue. Here's another answer, how to say slits as? You don't say it, you use it. Some other distributions, such as MX Linux, when you boot up, if you go into advanced options, there's an option to boot from RAM. Gremel Linux, I, I, I don't know how you say it, GRML Linux also has an option in the menu, but not all distributions have the option to boot to RAM in a selectable option. So today we're going to look at how to boot those distributions from RAM. Now, I mainly stick with Debian distributions. I'm not sure if this, uh, how this works with other distributions, but basically we're just going to pass a flag to the kernel to say boot everything from RAM, and it's super simple. We're going to do it with a few dif different distributions, so let's go ahead and have a quick look. Okay, we're going to start out with Gremlin Linux. Again, this is one of those distributions that does give you the option. If we go to boot options, we can choose that, and we can go down to load to RAM. So it's going to start the boot process, and here in a moment you'll see that right here it's copying over the file system, 43%, 68%, 100%. So at this point, if I was running on a physical machine, I could unplug the USB flash drive or eject the CD. Uh, this distribution uh, is the smaller version. It's only about a half a gig. And again, I'm running a virtual machine, so it copied over fairly quickly. But again, the speed of it copying to your RAM will depend on your machine and your flash drive. But uh, it does add to the boot time, but now everything is running completely from RAM, and I just had to choose that selection from the menu. So here we're working with MX Linux, and down at the bottom here you'll see F4 gives you options. If I hit F4, you can see that there is an option to RAM. When I click that, and then I start booting, it will now load to RAM. And again, this is a bigger distribution, so it will take a little bit longer to copy to RAM, about 2 gigs. Again, I'm working in a virtual machine, so it's going pretty quickly. But once this little process here is done, in real life, if I was working with physical hardware, I could unplug a USB flash drive or a CD-ROM. So again, here's another distribution that gives you that option in the boot options where you can just select. So moving on to distributions that don't give you the options in the menu. Here we are with Ubuntu. So I'm booting Ubuntu, or however you say it. And uh, you can see we have try or install. Now you'll notice right here we have the option E to edit. So I'm going to hit E, and here we have our boot options. And right down here where it says Linux, this is your Linux kernel, and these are the options you're passing to it. All you have to do is, somewhere in this line, we're going to write to RAM, all one word, just like that. And that's all you have to do, and then you can hit uh, F10 to continue. But I'm going to erase where it says splash and quiet so we can see what's going on. Otherwise, uh, you don't see. It just gives you the little process that it's booting, but it doesn't show you everything. I'm going to go ahead and hit F10 now. And you'll see in a moment, it will say copying to RAM, or it's going to be mounting some RAM. Uh, so yeah, copying live media to RAM, and it shows you the command it's running. Uh, it doesn't give you a nice progress bar like the other distributions do. But once this is done copying to RAM, we'll have a system loaded to RAM. So here we are with a Debian Live distribution. Now, there is an advanced options here, but there's no option to uh, boot to RAM. So we'll go back and we'll go up to the default option here. Now, in some distributions, you hit E, but you look right here, it says right at the bottom of the screen, tab to edit the menu entry. So we'll hit tab and it gives us the menu option here. You see Linux is giving us the kernel. And again, all we have to do is hit space to RAM. And I can go ahead at this point and hit enter to continue. Now, it does have the quiet splash screen. So if I hit that, it's going to show a splash screen again, just like uh, Ubuntu would. Uh, but you can hit delete on the keyboard and it will show you what's going on. And here we go, it's copying the file system to RAM. It does give you a percentage bar, unlike Ubuntu. I don't know why Ubuntu doesn't. I guess it's just Ubuntu. But here we go, we can see 71%, 80%, 93%. And now we are copied to RAM. And again, I could remove that disk uh, if I was booting to actual hardware. Uh, so you can see just adding to the kernel options, that to RAM option will allow you to boot to RAM. 
let's try another distribution here we are now with linux mint again uh read what it says on the screen but as you can see uh in this case we're going to hit e to edit and just like on ubuntu we'll go down to the line with linux we'll go to the end and just in here whoops we'll type to ram again you can remove the quiet and splash so you don't get the splash screen but if you accidentally continue which in this case you can hit Control x or f10 just read what it says on the screen and it will tell you what to do i'll go ahead and hit f10 it will start to boot if the splash screen comes up and i want to see what's going on all i have to do is hit there's different keys but i'll hit delete and here just like ubuntu since this distribution of linux mint is based on ubuntu it's not going to give you a percentage on how much is copied but you can see here that it is mounting some uh ram a temp file system and then it will load to ram and now you're running from RAM. So there you have it. You, now you can boot your distributions of Linux completely to RAM with no hard disks whatsoever, including the drive that contained the original file system. Now, some distributions, again, do it automatically, usually smaller distributions. Some will give you the options menu. But now, even if they don't give you the option in the menu, you know how to get it to boot to RAM, at least, again, on Debian-based systems. I would assume this would be the same on other distributions of Linux that aren't Debian-based, since this is a, a kernel flag, and we're just passing this information to the kernel. Uh, but I haven't tested it out on, like, Arch-based distributions or, you know, Fedora or anything like that. But give it a try. Let me know in the comments if you try it on one of these other distributions and let me know if it works or doesn't work. So I thank you for watching. Again, my website is filmsbychris.com. I'm Chris. That's Chris with a K. Link in the description. I also have a Patreon page. You can also support me through LibrePay, PayPal. I thank you for watching, liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting, all that good stuff. And as always, I hope that you have a great day. Okay, here's something that I came across today. My, my my wife wanted to get a copy of this little crochet instructions for creating these crocheted bears. Now, we created an account and we logged in. It was free to create an account and log in, and we can see all the instructions. My wife can just follow along on this web page. But uh, let's say we wanted to print this or have a PDF that we could save. Now, you might go, Chris, there's a button right on the screen that says download PDF. There's also one up at the top of the page here that says download PDF. But if you click on that, it actually just brings you to a website where they try to sell you stuff. We just want to be able to print or have a PDF of this page. And so you go, okay, control P to print and I'll save to PDF. Let me click on the page, control P and then print to PDF. But you'll notice in the preview here that all the instructions and images are missing. It won't let you print them. That's not an issue. This is just a CSS option. And since this is uh, HTML with CSS in a web browser, we can modify that. So we're gonna open up a developers tab in a Chromium based a browser, Chrome, Brave, which is what I'm in, Chromium, um, or Chrome. It's going to be F12. I think it's a little bit different in Firefox. I don't remember the keys, but F12 in most browsers will open up the developer console. We can click over here where it says elements. So make sure you're in elements and it shows you all the elements of the page. Within here, we're going to click, we're going to hit control F to search. And I'm just going to type in print and you'll see the first thing on the page. And depending on the web page, it may not be the first one that comes up, but we have, okay, media print. This is what we're going to do when we're printing for any item that has, in this case, class of inside article or legal notice. Uh, you'll see that uh, inside article, it's set to none, and the legal notice is set to inline. So it displays that when you go to print instead of the actual uh, instructions. So what do we do? How do we get this so that we can view it when printing? Well, we're just going to right click in this CSS here and click delete for that element. And it might, again, be slightly different on different pages, but you're going to look for something like that in CSS, some print, a media print option. And then we click back on the page. And now if I hit control P, now that we've remove those instructions to hide um, the article from printable view. It takes a moment because it's loading up more stuff, but now you can see I can print or save the PDF for this page. And that's it. Again, it's gonna be slightly different on each page, but you're gonna look for that media print option within CSS in most cases. And if you just remove it or modify it, you'll be able to print what you wanna print. So thanks for watching, filmsbychris.com. Hope you found this useful. And as always, I hope that you have a great day. Hello and welcome to filmsbychris.com. Today we're gonna to be converting a whole bunch of stuff into JSON format. I love JSON format. I think it's it looks nice, it's clean, and it's easy to parse through and is widely used. And uh, we're gonna convert a whole bunch of stuff 
to JSON using a program called JC. Uh, if you are on a Debian-based system, and I'm assuming most other distributions, uh, you should be able to find it. I'm going to also grep for JSON, otherwise there's a lot of programs with the letters JC in it. But here we go, you can see JC is a JSON command line output utility. A viewer told me about this a while ago, and I've been meaning to do a video on it. I wish I wrote down the viewer's name so I can give them credit. It is a great little program. So sudo apt install JC on a Debian based system. Check your package manager for whatever distribution you use. But here is an example. I have a CSV file. CSV file is a comma separated file. Uh, so let me go ahead and just open that up with my spreadsheet editor here. And you can see in this particular case, the top column is the name of what each uh, the top row is the name of each column. So we have gender, a name title, name first, name last, email address, yeah, you know, login, UUID. So we have all that information. So that's how it knows when it converts it to JSON what to name each element of it. So let's go ahead and discard that. And now, instead of looking at it like so, and yeah, I could go through that, I could grep for stuff and then cut at the commas, but it could become confusing if some of the entries, like this right here, have commas. Then it's wrapped around parentheses, and then I have to figure out how to determine which comma is a comma that's a delimiter, and which one is just part of the string. It's a lot easier if I just convert JSON, because then I can use something like JQ, which I've talked about many times in the past, to, to parse through it. Uh, so all I have to do is cut out that file, but pipe it into JC. We're going to tell JC that this is a CSV file. Boom, and it converts it to uh, JSON. Now, that's just all on one row. I can say dash dash pretty, and it will make it pretty. Uh, but you can also shorten that up to just dash P. So again, we're cutting out that file into JC, dash dash CSV to tell it that it's CSV file, dash P for pretty, and we have that. And then we can, again, pipe that into JQ to find what we're looking for. Or even at that point, lots of times it's just getting to that point, you can now grep or sed through it fairly easily but JQ would be a better option if it's available. Another option, uh, and I'm going through this, JC supports so many different things. Their website, most of what I'm about to show you are just examples from their website, but I'll also link to my show notes in the description of this video. If I use PS, AUX, I can list running processes on my machine. Uh, and again, I could grep through that and try to awk through the different columns, but sometimes there's just spaces in the program names that can throw you off. Well, again, I can just use that same command Pipe it into JC, dash P for pretty, and then dash dash P S to say that this is, you know, process output, and it converts it to JSON. I can find what user started the process, the process ID, you know, is it a TTY when it started, you know, what app, what the command is, all the good stuff. Uh, now you can also, you know, you know, the date command's pretty simple, and you can get... Uh, you know, the date command has built-in things. If I just want to get the day or the week or the, the month or the day of the week or the year, I can get all that. But you could also, if you want it in JSON format, maybe you're going to be using it in another application, another programming language, and it's just easier to have it in JSON. Well, we have to tell it, uh, you know, what our date format is, and then the date, date command, and you can also export this as a variable. Uh, and then I'll pipe that into JC, date, date, and you can do pretty or dash P. And there we go. We have all this information, but now... Nicely labeled so I can get that specific piece of information. Again, date kind of has that built in, so but I wanted to show you that. That was an example on their website. How about the dig command? The dig command, you run that, give it a, a domain, and it will give you uh, information regarding that server. Well, we can also just say jc dash dash pretty, or again dash p uh, dig in that, and now it gives you that same input, but it's now converted it to a nice JSON format. Clean, easy to read. How about ARP? ARP's going to list uh, machines that are currently on my network, right? Well, let's get that in JSON format. Uh, pipe that in JC dash P for pretty dash dash ARP. So tell it it's ARP output. And now I have it in JSON format. This would be great like if you're running stuff on a server and you want to output it as some HTML. You can use some JavaScript to go through it a lot easier this way. How about the if command, right? I can do if or uh, the if command, if config to get um, you know information about my network. And of course we, we can pipe that into JC as well and get information like that. And of course, we could always pipe that into JQ and say, hey, look for this device and then get me the, the IP address. And that's one way to get your IP address. You know, I can use that with grep and awk and it's a little bit shorter but it's not as accurate because you might have more than one wireless device and uh, just have it in JSON format can be useful. Uh, how about the list command? Let's you know list stuff that's in my uh, USR bin, right? All the files in there, long list. Well, let's run that again. 
Again, we'll use JC and we'll tell it uh, that we want to make it pretty and that this command is from LS. It's LS output and we get all that information in JSON output. You're getting the idea here, right? How about we're going to ping something? Let's go ahead and ping 8.8.8.8.8. How many times did I say it? And we'll say three times. So it's going to take a second. It's going to ping that three times, but then JC is going to give us the replies and uh, the delays and all that in nice JSON output. Uptime, uptime, simple enough. This is my uptime and we can tell it, you know, give me that in JSON. Again, a lot of this, you could probably use awk to cut through this, but having it in JSON format just standardizes it for different languages and applications. And last example, we're going to use uh, it to convert some XML, which is one of the main reasons I would use this because a lot of things still use XML. I'm not a big fan of XML compared to JSON. I feel like JSON's cleaner, easier to parse through. In my opinion, I'm, I'm just probably more used to it. But I feel like JSON or XML just has way more characters than need because it has opening, closing tags instead of like, this is the name and then everything between the curly brackets is what you want. So here's an example of some uh, XML. We can run the same command, but then pipe it into JC, make it pretty XML. And now we have that same information in json format that is it i thank you for watching once again films by chris.com that's chris with a k there's a link in the description i have a patreon page if you like my videos if you find them useful think about supporting there also have paypal and libre pay on my website films by chris.com all oh, there's links to all that on my website and in the description of the video i do thank you for watching i thank you for your support those who are financially supporting me and those who are not financially supporting me i thank you for subscribing liking, sharing, and commenting. I hope that you have a great day. So you want to make a video game and you want to have cool 8-bit sound effects. And of course you can go to a website where they have tons of free sound effects that you can search through and they may have licenses that are available for whatever project you're working on. But why? When you can make your own. Let's go ahead and do that. So you're going to want to use whatever package manager you have for your distribution and you want to search for SFXR. In my case on Debian, I'm going to install SFXR-QT. I'm going to be using apps. So we're going to sudo app that. Once it's installed, we're going to run it. SFX. R dash QT at the shell or find it in your app menu. <laughs> this is what the interface looks like. It's super simple. So up here on the left, you have generators, pickups or coins, lasers, shooters, uh, explosions, power-ups, all these things have similar attributes. So clicking these will set presets that generate a random sound, but with those attributes. So for example, I can click this and I get a coin. Let me turn my volume up here. So each time I do it, it's a different sound, but it's that similar sound of a coin or pickup. You're collecting something. You can get lasers. And explosions. Power-ups. Getting hit or hurt. And of course, jump sounds. And you'll notice over here on the left, you have sounds as you generate them, as you're going through and you click on these. If you hear one you like, but you've already clicked on the button again, you can see the previous ones here on the left. So you can go back to a previous one by clicking on it here. And once you've found one, uh, you can also use tools. You can play the sound again down here. And on the left, you can mutate that. So it's going to take that sound, but just tweak it a little bit. So you can modify it and of course you can adjust all the settings by yourself here in the middle and of course you can save that as a WAV file. You did it! You created your own sound effects with a simple little simpl simplifier, simplifier, synthesizer here and uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome to a video from filmsbychris.com. I am Chris, that's Chris with the K. There's a link in the description to my website. Today we're gonna to be talking about 
archives, TAR archives. So we're going to be working with TAR. What is TAR? TAR stands for TAR archive, or sorry, tape archive. And uh, so back in the day, storage was really expensive. And one of the ways we would store stuff is on tape. And so we would use TAR to put files on a tape. We still use that program, but we're saving to files rather than physical tapes. And uh, it will allow us to take a directory and basically put all the files into one file. Let's go ahead and, and do that as an example here. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say tar-c for create, v for verbose. That will list the files out as they're being compressed. If you, you don't need that in there, if you want it to be quiet as it's compressing, I kind of like seeing the files uh, listed as they go in. And then dash f for the file name. Then the name of the file. So in this case, I'm just going to call it projects.tar. And I'm giving it a directory, USR local bin, which is where I keep all my scripts for my system. And I will go ahead and run that. And you can see it lists out all the files because we had that V option in there. If I list out what's in our current directory, you can see we have the tar archive. If I show a little more information on that, you can see that it is 208 megabytes. There is no compression going on here. This is just the files all put into one file. Now to extract those, it's super simple. You say tar dash X for extract F and then the project or the file name in this case, projects.tar. And you do that. It's going to uncompress them all. We list it out. You can see or not uncompress it, but extract them all. Uh, and you can see there's a, it extracts the directories. So USR local bin, and you can see all the files in there. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to remove that directory we just created. And we still have our tape archive here. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to say tar dash C for create Z for zip. Because again, the first thing we did was just put all the files into one file, but there was no compression going on to compress. We're going to use GZ or gzip, and uh, we can do that right within the tar command. And I'm going to say again, V for verbose. You don't need that, but that will list the files as they're being compressed dash F and our project file name. So this time I'm going to say project.tar.gz and I'll give it that same directory as before, uh, USR local bin. Now again, so gzip can compress a file, but it can compress a directory to the best of my direct, my knowledge where tar will take a directory or group of files and put them into one file. So basically you're creating one file. That's all the files put together and then you're compressing it. You can see it's taking a little bit longer. When we did the first command, we didn't compress it. It took like a second that took maybe five seconds. But if we were to list out all our files now, you can see that our compressed archive is less than half the size of our original archive. So we're compressing it, it slows things a little bit down when you're compressing it or extracting it, but makes the file size a lot smaller. And you can give it options as to how much it compresses it. And that will slow things down, but make a smaller file in some cases. It can press pretty good here because most of the files in that directory are scripts, which means they're plain text, which means they compress very well. There are a couple of binary things in there uh, that aren't going to compress so well because, well, they're binary files that are probably already compressed to some point. Okay. so. We've created a tar archive. We create a tar archive that's been compressed with gzip. We've extracted it. Let's go ahead and see. Let's say you have an archive file and you want to see what's in that. You want to list the files. We'll use tar T. Uh, T, I'm, I'm not really sure what T stands for. I'm maybe table of contents, uh, but it will list out what files in there. I'm going to say verbose F for file. I'll give it the file name and I'll give it the tar gz file. And there you go. It's listing out all the files and information about them to the screen. So I didn't need to extract anything. Uh, so that's great. But let's say I'm looking for a specific file. So I could do something. I could run that command. Of course, I could put it in grep and I can say something like uh, YouTube play. And you can see any file that has uh, YT play in it will show up. Uh, but we don't need to pipe it into another command. Now, if I wanted to look for this file here, I could actually just after uh, within our tar command here, I can just in quotation marks, put the name of that file and it'll list it out. Oh, yep. It's in there. The thing is, uh, writing it like that, you need to know the full name and path. If I just said YT play, it's not going to find that. It's going to say it's not in the archive, but what you could do is you could do something like dash dash wild card cards with an S. And if I do that might need to put 
little asterisk around there. There we go. Now it's listing everything with uh, YT play in there, and it's doing it without having to put it into grep. So that's how you would do that. You would search through using wildcards and use your little asterisks here. Otherwise, you need to give it the full file name. Uh, but that way, you can look through what files are in there. And once you know what files are in there, you can find the file you want. And instead of extracting them all, you could extract just one. So again, I just want to make sure. OK, I already deleted the USR folder. So what I'm going to say now is I'm going to say tar-zxvy. And then I'm going to give it the, the uh, archive name. And then I'm going to give it the file name that I want to extract. But again, I got to give it the, the full name. So actually, let me go ahead and do this again. And let's say I want to extract um, this file here. So what I would do is I would say tar dash z x v f and our project file name. And then the full path to the file we want within the archive. OK, so we're going to run that. And it's extracting just that one file. If I list out now, you can see we have that USR directory. And I can sit, look inside that directory, and it's just that file. Now, again, if I want to extract multiple files that are matched, I could do something like this. I could say dash dash wildcards. And I can say, whoops. So let's try that again. I have a bunch of scripts with YT in it. Those are my YouTube scripts. So I'll just go ahead and do that. And you can see it's extracting all of those, but just those ones with that match. So if I was to list out what's in there now, it's extracted all those files. Now, I hope you found this video useful. I will put a link in the description to all the notes of everything I just did. Uh, so you can uh, look at those, copy and paste them, hold on to those notes for yourself. But also be sure to check out my website. And that's filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There will also be a link in the description to my website. It's a great place to search through all my videos. And uh, I thank you for watching. Please like, share, subscribe, comment, and also check out my Patreon page. And there's other ways to support me under the support section on my website. I thank you for watching. And as always, I hope that you have a great day. Ho, 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 and Merry Christmas. It's Christmas. Did you get a new game? Did you get a new game for Christmas? And, and it's for your computer, but they only have keyboard mappings, and you want to map it to a controller, but you can't figure out how to do it? Well, that's what we're going to do over today. We're going to set it up so that you can map your controller to any key on a keyboard to use in any game that uses a keyboard so that you can now use the controller, even though a mouse and keyboard is better, and I don't care what people say. So if you need to do this, so again, maybe you have a game and the developer didn't put in uh, controller options, but you want to use a controller. Or you don't like the way it's set up and they don't let you reconfigure it in the game, but you can now remap it to the keys on the keyboard for any button to be any key on the keyboard. So that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to use Doom as an example. Uh, Doom, I'm pretty sure, probably has uh, controller settings in it, joystick settings in it, Joy controller settings, stick, stick, boom, in it. Yeah. <laughs> But I'm just going to use that as an example. Who would play Doom with this when you can use a mouse and keyboard and actually use all your fingers instead of just, you know, your thumbs and maybe one or two other fingers? What we're going to use today is a program that is called, what is it called? It is called QJoyPad. Now, you're going to install that from your repository. So if you're on a Debian-based system, so Ubuntu, Linux Mint, stuff like that, you're just going to use whatever package manager you normally use, but you can just sudo apt install QJoyPad. Once it's installed, you just run it, and by default, it's going to show up in your system tray. So you're going to run it, and nothing's going to pop up, but then you'll notice down by your clock and your system tray, or wherever your system tray is, you'll have an icon for it. You click on it, and it brings up this menu here. Normally, I don't like recording my screen with a camera, but I'm going to be going back and forth from showing you stuff on the screen and showing you stuff in real life, so that's just the easiest way to do it. Now, by default, it's going to show you all your joysticks, all your game pads that are connected. Right now it's showing four. Really, I only have one game pad connected, but I have a drawing tablet that actually shows up as uh, game control uh, or joysticks on my system. So that's what these three are. But it doesn't matter with Q Joypad, once you start pressing buttons on any controller, you can see, oh, it's telling me it's this controller. And then when you click on that controller, when you press a button, it tells you which button that is. So it very quickly can easily detect what button it is. Now there's a quick set option that will let you set all the buttons in order without having to go back and forth. But we're just going to set up a few as an example. And just to show you real quick, if I go into Doom here and I start the game, the controller doesn't do anything, right? No, it doesn't do anything. Oh, actually it does. This button, by default, is my shoot button. So Doom, by default, is detecting this as a controller but nothing else seems to be working. Doesn't matter, we're gonna set it up with the keyboard. So let's go ahead and just drag this back over. Now, 
First thing that we're going to do, we'll set up this for our little D-pad here for moving left, right, back, and forward. So again, I can press down or up, and it's the same button because it's an, this is an axis, or an axis, not a button. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this, and hopefully you can see this. We have, we're setting it to be a mouse or keyboard button, and I'm going to click this first key here, and I'm going to hit W for up, and I'm going to hit this one, and I'm going to hit S for down. Okay, now my left, right buttons. So I press that. Okay, that's going to be axis 5. I'm going to press that, and in here I'm going to press A for left and D for right. Now, I want to be able to look around. So I have my little axis here, and it's telling me that left and right is 1, and up and down is 2. And mainly I'm going to be looking left and right with this. I'm not going to worry for about up and down, although I could. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to click on this, and instead of setting it to a keyboard or mouse button, I'm going to click this, and I'm going to choose either mouse vertical, mouse vertical, vertical reverse, horizontal, or horizontal reverse. And I'm pretty sure I want mouse horizontal, because I'm looking left and right, and I don't think I want it inverted. When I move this left and right, it's going to act like my mouse. But the speed is set to 100, which I've already tested this out, is way too high. You can tweak it to your number. I am going to set it to 10. We'll give that a try. Okay, now I just have to pull this out of the way. Let me go back into Doom here. Use this. Oh, I did forget one thing. See, every time I do it, I'm moving one little frame. Let me go back into our program here. And what I want to do is I want to set this to uh, gradient. There we go. And I'll click OK now. Move this out of the way. Go back into here. This might demonstrate a little bit better. So I can go forward, back, left, and right. And I can turn left and right with this here. I can set this to look up and down. I haven't done that yet. But you would do the same process as we did for left and right, only you're going to set it to vertical instead of horizontal. Real quick, let's activate our gun and our button that opens doors. So uh, I think I want B to be my gun. Actually, let's make, let's make the right trigger. So I'll press right trigger, and you can see right here that it's button 6. So I can go in here, I go button 6, and I'm going to click key here, and then I'm going to just, uh, by default, it's going to be my left mouse button. So I'll just click on there, and it says mouse 1. OK. And I can do the same thing if I want more than one trigger button. I can set B to be my trigger button, so that's going to be button 3. And I'll also set that to mouse click 1, just by clicking on that box. Now, to activate the door on the keyboard would be E. I'm going to set it to A on my butt keyboard here, or on my controller here. It's button 2, so I'll just click on here, and I'm going to hit, or I have to click here, and then click E. OK. Now, again, now, I'm setting this up for Doom, so I can say save and save this as Doom. I can import, export, so I can move it to other computers. Let's go ahead and just move this out of the way. So you can save it, different settings for different games. And here we go. Let's go ahead and get going. Again, controlling it with a game controller is kind of weird, especially this game controller. It's an N64 game controller. Uh, this will open, and then I should be able to shoot. So now you know you can map any button on your game pad to be any key on your keyboard. So now all you have to do is set this up, go into LibreOffice, and type up reports with this. <laughs> or whatever you want. You can control anything that uses the keyboard now with your controller here. So you can, you know, surf web pages with this uh, with ease. So I hope you found this useful. Uh, it's not something I use much because I prefer using keyboard and mouse with uh, a lot of games, although it does depend on the game. Uh, first person shooter, in my opinion, keyboard and mouse, way, way better option. But I know people like playing on consoles and you would use a controller for that. Uh, and a, a controller is definitely better if you're sitting on a couch. Play around with this. Again, it's J all one word, all lowercase. So you sudo apt install JQ pad and or no sorry Q joy pad and that's it. It will uh, you can open it up. It sits in your console. You can close it when you want. You can save your settings, export it. You can make different settings for different games. Filmsbychris.com. That's my website. Check it out. Link in the description to that. My Patreon page, my PayPal page is on my site. All that stuff. If you want to support me? Like, share, subscribe, comment, and I hope that you have a great day. Merry Christmas. This is a stick of RAM. You have one in your device, or at least something similar, whether it's a laptop, desktop, or even your mobile device. You have RAM. Now, obviously, your phone doesn't have a big stick of RAM like this. It's probably a tiny little chip on there. In fact, laptops nowadays probably don't have something that look like this. They're usually smaller or, or even soldered onto the board of laptops nowadays. But RAM is where things are stored before they're processed. So any application you're running or files you have loaded are in RAM.
What if I told you you could store files on RAM? Well, put files on RAM. I wouldn't use it too much for storage. So what, what does that mean? Why would you do that? Well, theoretically, if you have stuff, files on RAM, whether they're files or applications, theoretically they should load faster because they're in RAM and RAM should be faster than your hard drive. Nowadays, solid state drives and the way they are, they're pretty fast. So I don't know if you'll notice too much of a difference, but especially on older machines. On older machines, having something in RAM will make a big difference. I've noticed when I've taken like, let's say I take a machine that's like 25, 30 years old, right? I can run Linux on them still because Linux is backwards compatible like that. But, and sometimes they'll run really well until you start saving files because writing to those old disks is super slow. Well, you could actually just put everything in RAM. And obviously, the older machines, you're limited on RAM, but speed is one reason that you might want to do it. Another time I've seen where there's RAM uh, as drives is on small devices like a router. If you've ever worked with a router where you've gotten a shell because they, most routers run Linux, uh, I have found that your operating system is on a small flash, maybe only 8 megabytes or 16 megabytes, but it still needs more space to run. Linux is very small and the basic tools you need to run it are small so they can fit in that 8 or 16 megabytes. But to actually run and generate files, there's no room on the flash. So what they'll normally do, or at least I've seen done, I don't want to say they normally do it, but what I've seen done is they will mount their temp directory and any place that needs to be written temporarily to RAM. Now, unlike on your desktop where it's writing stuff in your temp directory to your hard drive and then it's wiped out when you reboot, these smaller devices will just mount a RAM directory because they might have 32 gigs, or 32 gigs, they don't have 32 gigs, 32 megabytes of RAM, so they have more space to load things. So there's a few uses. Uh, also, privacy. So you're writing files to your hard drive, even if you delete them, we all know that you can, unless you override the files on the drive, they can be recovered. Well, on RAM, once you turn the power off to it, they're pretty much gone. Theoretically, they're on there for like up to a minute. If you freeze the RAM with a cold boot attack, it might be a couple of minutes. Highly unlikely. But if you have files that you don't want someone to be able to recover, but you want to manipulate or whatever on your device, you can load them to RAM. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to create a directory on our device and then say, take part of my RAM and make it storage on that folder. And then anything you put in there, well, again, not only load faster, but when you restart the device, should be completely wiped out. And for the most part, not recoverable. So let's go ahead. May not be something you do often, but it doesn't hurt to know. And it's really, really simple. Literally one to two commands. One command to create a directory and another command to say, mount a specific amount of RAM to that directory. Okay, here we go. This is again, super simple. I'll link notes in the description, but again, it's two commands. The first one, we're gonna create a directory, which you could do in your home directory or anywhere on your system uh, if you are doing in your home directory you don't need sudo if you're mounting it in a directory like we're going to you'll need to sudo to at least create the directory you'll still need sudo to uh, mount the directory but we'll just make a directory under mnt and we'll call it tempfs because it's a temporary file system so we've created that directory and now all we have to do is say sudo mount and then we're going to say dash o size equals and in this case i'll say one gig so i'm going to say i want it to be one gig in size Next, I'm going to say dash T for type, and I'm going to say tempfs because it's a temporary file system. Then we're going to say none. I'm not really sure what the none is for. It's just in my notes. And then we're going to say where we're going to put it. And again, it's going to be that uh, tempfs under MNT. And that is it. If I was to run mount now, you can see, make that a little smaller so everything's on one line for one moment. Uh, you can see here that we have mounted a temp file system tells you the size there in kilobytes. If I was to df-h, it will list all my drives and you can see that it's a temp file, or it's mounted a temp file system and the size is one gig and it's one gig available because I haven't written anything to there. So let's go ahead and go into that directory, uh, tempfs, and I could, you know, echo test into a file, test, I can date into a date file. And now we have, files there, I can df-h, and you can see that we've used a little bit of space, but this is in RAM, anything I put on here. And again, you can copy applications here, and theoretically those applications will load faster because they're loading from RAM. Uh, but that's pretty much it, it is that simple. Now, when I restart uh, 
this direct this directory uh the directory will still exist but the stuff in it will be completely gone and they were never written to the hard drive so they can't be recovered from your hard drive if i was to move out of this directory i can sudo u mount and i will unmount that directory uh theoretically they're still in your ram i would assume uh but ram is being written to all times gonna be all written again once power is cut to it that stuff is going to disappear so again this is if you're really paranoid and you want to make sure that files aren't recoverable but you're able to manipulate and use them how you can uh you can obviously download files to that directory use them and then remove then when you reboot it's gone so that's it your whole system isn't now now you be aware if you're doing this for privacy reasons and you open up something like gimp and you're manipulating an image it may be gimp might be storing files and copies of those files into other directories so that's something you need to be aware of it might be your temp directory or somewhere in your home directory i really don't know i'm just saying that as a blanket example uh but if you're in the shell and you're creating stuff modifying stuff you know you're pretty much sure that everything you're writing is going where you're writing and there aren't backup and temp and recovery and history files uh but that's it super simple again there's a link in the description to the two commands but the main command you're looking at is this mount command Again, you can change this to basically any size. Just make sure it's within the size of your RAM and don't, and you still need RAM to work as RAM. So if you have eight gigs or 16 gigs or 32 gigs, don't make the file, uh, the, the mounted directory that size. I would assume that would cause problems. I haven't tried it. I don't even know if it will let you do that. Um, but that's it. Thanks for watching films by Chris.com. That's Chris with the K. There's a link in the description. As always, I hope that you have a great day. Hello and welcome to a video from filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. I am Chris. There's a link to my website in the description of this video. And today we're going to be looking at a poor man's port scanner. Now, if you need to do port scanning, uh, my personal opinion, the best port scanner out there is going to be Nmap. And you should use that if you can. But let's say you don't have Nmap. Uh, there are other options uh, that you may not know about. And map uh, is on is easy to install on systems, but if you're on a minimal system, you may not. But if you have Bash, and I specifically say Bash because this is a Bash feature, you may not know about unless you've been around uh, the uh, Linux world for a while. Um, is that Bash actually has networking capabilities built in? If I was to list out stuff in my dev directory, which is my devices, so you know basically mostly hardware stuff, you can see all this stuff here. You know. Uh, video would usually be webcams or other video inputs. Uh, but if we look at T's here, see we have these TTYs, but there's no TCP. Now, if I was to echo into dev and give it a file name that either exists or doesn't exist, most cases I'm gonna get a permission denied, right? Because I don't have permission to write stuff there. But if I was to write to TCP and give it some a number and then another number, it just kind of hangs. What's going on there? Why Why is it not giving me permission denied or file does not exist or something along those lines? Control C to kill that. Because even though you don't see the dev TCP inside that directory, it does exist within Bash. Bash will create these things as we go. So if I was to echo into that, I could give it a IP address or a domain name and a port and I can retrieve information or at least detect information from those uh, servers. You can use this to pull down files uh, and web pages from the internet. Uh, the problem with it, and, and that's something you can look up, I'm not gonna go over in this video, it, it's not as useful as it used to be because of HTTPS as far as I'm, I know. Uh, HTTPS, the encryption doesn't work through this, so you'll just basically get an error. If anyone uh, can correct me and point me to tutorials on uh, doing this with HTTP, HTTPS, that'd be great. But even though it's not as useful as it used to be for downloading files and information from web servers, you can still use it as a port scanner. Now, there'll be directions or notes in the description of this video to everything I'm about to go over, but if I was to echo into TCP or dev TCP, again, give it an IP address or a domain name. I'll just give it uh, 127.0.0.1, which is the same as localhost. So I'm pointing it at my own machine. And then I go forward slash in a port number. In this case, I'll do eight, right? What are we gonna do? Oh, we get an error, connection refused, because I don't have port eight open. But if I was say port 80, which I do, because I'm running a web server on my computer, I get no error. So of course we can detect 
was the last command successful or not? So here I can say ampersand ampersand, and I can say echo port is open. And when I do that, I get port is open. But if I was to go back to like any port that's not open, but I'll do eight again, you can see we get our error. Now we can always then say our or operator. So pipe pipe, and I can say echo port is closed. And now we'll get our error message with port is closed. So we have port is closed. And if I was to scan port 80, we have port is open. Now let's say we, we don't probably don't want this error message. We just want to know that the port is closed. What I could do is wrap this in parentheses and then say two greater than and pipe all the errors into dev null. And now we'll get either port is open or port is closed. And of course, we can do this with a for loop now to loop through everything. So I'm not going to print out if a port is closed because I'm going to be scanning a bunch of directories. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to say for and we're going to create a variable called I and we're going to loop through the number 20, in this case, to 10,000. You could also give it a, a list of ports that you want to scan, but I'm just going to scan a bunch of ports. Then we're going to take that information and we're going to, again, echo basically nothing, basically putting a new line character into dev, TCP, and then an IP address or domain name, and then that port that we're generating over here. Dump all errors to null, and then we'll just, if the port is open, if that is successful, we'll say port, and then give it the port name is open. I'll run that on my local host here, and you can see it's listing all my open ports. And it doesn't take too long because I'm running on my local machine. If you were to do a remote machine, it'd be a little bit slower, uh, but I could do something like so. I could say, instead of looking at my local host, I'll just point it at my router and I will run this. And now it's going to start listing all the open ports on my router. So that is a poor man's uh, port scanner. Uh, so again, this is uh, a functionality of Bash and possibly other shells. I know it doesn't work in Z shell, but it's, it's built in Bash. And that's why you won't see this directory because it doesn't really exist. If you just look at it in Bash, Bash goes, OK, we're looking for a server, a port. And again, there's commands you can do to download files from a website uh, or other network operations. but Again, with current modern web uh, sites, mostly using HTTPS, that's, I, as far as I know, has become mostly useful, useless. Uh, but if you are on a bash system, you don't have Nmap, and you need to do a quick, simple scan of ports, this is something you can do. Again, there's links in the description of this video to all the notes that I went over, so you can look at those. Um, I hope that, again, this is not something you're probably going to use regularly, because Nmap is just a better, uh, a better option, but in a pinch, Having this information, this knowledge, uh, could be very useful. I thank you for watching. Please visit my website, filmsbychris.com. Again, that's Chris with a K. There'll be a link in the description. I also have a Patreon page. I have a PayPal account and a LibrePay account. If you can support me financially, oh, that would be so great. I would appreciate it. If not, I do thank you for watching, for sharing, subscribing, commenting, giving thumbs up or likes or whatever. And I just hope that you have. A great day. Hello and welcome to a video from filmsbychris.com. I am Chris. That's Chris with a K. Link in the description of my website. Today we're going to be uh, creating a script just to make life easier, right? So if you're on a Linux system, you have package managers. Depending on uh, what system you have, you have different package managers. I am on a Debian system. If you're on a Debian-based system, you're using some sort of apt. So apt or apt-get, or I prefer aptitude. So if I was to use aptitude, I could search, for example, if I was looking to install a package, I could say search bash, and it will list all applications with the name bash in it. And uh, so then I can take one of those. Let's say I want to install bash. I mean, I already have it installed, but let me go sudo apt install, or actually I can do aptitude install, and I will give it the bash name. It'll ask for my password, and I will run that. It's already installed. It will tell me that it's already installed, and that is fine. So what I want to do, though, is I want to be able to have this list come up and then filter through that by typing and then grab multiple packages and have them all installed. And we're going to do that using aptitude and FZF. We're going to write a script. It's going to be uh, less than 10 lines long for sure, maybe closer to five. Uh, but let's go ahead and just and look at this real quick. So again, I can do this to search for the phrase bash, right? And what I can do is I can pipe that into FZF. 
and it will give me that list and then I can type in something like top and there's bash top I could enter and it returns that if I want to select multiple files I can say fzf m and now when I do that I can uh, you know say top I can say uh, tab on that one, tab on that one, tab on that one, and now it lists out all three that I had selected with the tab. Great, but of course we want to give it some sort of prompt so the user know what's what's to, the user knows what to do. Dash dash prompt, uh, and then what we want it to say we'll say select packages, and we'll make that look nice. We'll run that, and now we have our little select packages. I can type in something like node, and I can select you know, whatever packages I want here. I type node wrong, but it still filtered it fairly decently. And we will run that and list those out. Okay, we just want the package name, right? So that's the second column. So what we can do here is we can now put this into awk. And I can do uh, curly braces there, or whatever you want to call them. And I'll say print dollar sign two, that's the second column. So now we still get our full list with the description. Again, I can say node, and I can tab through those three. And now it gives us a list of just the package names. But we want those all on one line, but with spaces between them. So real simply, we'll just put that into TR. We'll say backslash N. So we're going to convert all new lines to spaces. Again, I'll just do node. I'll do tab, 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 or however many of these I want. And then it lists them all in a row. Now we can just take that output and we can put it into our apt or aptitude or apt get command to download. So let's go ahead and start working on this as a script, okay? So I'm going to say... Vim and I'll call this app search. You can call it app search.sh if you want. Uh, and my Vim configuration automatically puts this header into all my uh, uh, script files, my shell script files. So that's good. You just need the bash uh, shebang line there saying that this is a bash script. And uh, first thing we need to do is is the user giving an input. So when we run our script, uh, is the user giving us uh, search queries. So I'll just say, look at the first argument. Okay, is there a first argument? If there is a first argument, we're going to say Q equals whatever that first argument is. Okay, now let's say the user doesn't give us any input when it runs the command initially, when it, when they run the command initially. So we'll say our or operator, so pipe pipe, we're going to use the read command dash P and give it a prompt and we'll say enter search query. Whoa. There we go. And then we will create that variable Q. So we're either looking at, did they pass it when they typed in the command? If not, request it. And then we'll check, did the user actually give us anything? If they didn't, well then we're just gonna exit right there. Okay, and real quick, just to show you, I'll echo out Q. We'll save that. We will make it executable, like so. Now, again, we have our script in our directory here, I'll dot slash that. And if I give it something like bash, it will echo out bash, because that's why I typed. If I give it nothing, then it will ask me for something that I can type in bash or whatever I want to search for. Great, now we're going to move on. We're going to run our command that we created earlier uh, and put that into a variable. So let's go ahead back into our script here. And just to save time, I will copy and paste. I'll delete that echo line because we don't need that. That was just for demonstration purposes. Um, so I am going to say this. We're going to say we're running our aptitude search with our query up here as long as something was passed. Otherwise, we've already exited. We're going to put that into FCF search, make sure we're selecting multiple files if we need to, putting all those on one line and putting that into a variable called PKG. Now we want to make sure that we actually selected stuff because if we didn't, we're just going to exit at this point. So we're going to say, okay, PKG, uh, should we exit now? I don't need the quotation marks around these variables when we're checking them, but just to be consistent, I'm either going to have them or not have them. So now we have quotation marks around that. Okay. So again, now I can run our script. I can say bash. It's going to search for bash. And now I have a list I can filter through. So I give it an initial search and then it will give me a list that I can filter through and select from. Right. And, or if I didn't, I can say something like node, right. And it's going to give a long list of node stuff. And I can say bash. There we go. I selected one. Okay. So let's finish it off. We now, as long as we have selected something from that list, we are now going to run this. We're going to sudo apt install the packages, right? So let's go ahead and give that a try. I will run our script. I'll say bash. 
and I will just check things I already have installed like so just so we don't install anything I don't want we'll run that and you can see all those are up to date if they weren't they would have been installed and if we were to not give anything here I could type bash here or whatever I want my search query to be to f narrow down the list. If I don't give anything, it exits. If I was to give it something and I was to go here, let's say I was to type in stuff that doesn't exist and I have nothing selected, it should exit out before it gets to that. So again, we have a nice little script here. One, two, three, four, five lines of code and now you have a quick way to search through packages uh, not that it was hard to do it with just aptitude search but now it's you know you're able to filter through the list a little bit quicker and easier so now instead of running aptitude search query find the package name aptitude search install or aptitude install package name you just run your once you put this inside your system path your app search search for your package filter the list select multiples if you want and it's installed. I'll put a link to this script in the description of this video. I hope you check it out and I hope you find it useful. Please visit my website. Again, filmsbychris.com. That's Chris of the K. Uh, and there you can also find links to my Patreon page, my Libre account, and my PayPal account. If you could support me somehow financially, that would be amazing. And I'll stop singing if you do that for me. <laughs> and um, if not, I do thank you just for watching. Sharing this video with other people you think might like it would be awesome as well. Giving it a like and a comment would also be appreciated. But if anything, I just hope that you have a great day. Okay, here I am. I'm going to echo out this multi-line string. Not a problem, right? It does it. Great job. But let's say I wanted to store that string. There's a few things here that might be issues. One, it's multi-line. So we may want to remove those new lines which we could use set or tr to do that, but we also want to preserve those. So if we're going to take the string and put it into a database or a JSON file or some other type of storage, we kind of want it on a, all on one line, but to preserve where the new line characters are. We also have these quotation marks that could be ca that cause problems. And I also have a Unicode character here that could cause problems. So how can we easily convert all this? Yeah, you could use said and awk and, and stuff like that. But actually, the tool JQ, which is used for parsing through JSON files, can actually do this for you. So again, quotation marks... You know, if I wanted to, I could go like this. I could backslash them out and, and that would work, but I would have to do that for each quotation mark. And we may not know the string. We may be pulling data from someplace using a script and we want to automatically put these backslashes in there. And also, again, we want to convert this Unicode character to something a little more compatible. And again, preserve those new line characters. So let's go up to our first example here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pipe this into JQ. Now, JQ may not be installed on your system by default, but will most likely be in your repositories for your uh, Linux system. So go ahead and install that. It's a very useful tool. And what I'm going to say here is if I say dash capital R and then a period, what we're going to do here, what does that do? Well, that automatically went ahead and put backslashes before our quotation marks there and we'll do it for other characters as well in certain cases it will just take care of that for you you don't have to come up with your own little uh, algorithm to figure that out uh, now we still uh, have everything here with the unicode character so what i can add to that is dash a so lowercase a so dash r lowercase a and now it converted that into a more compatible format for us but we still have everything as multiple strings each line is a new string we don't want that so let's go ahead run the same command we're going to add s for slurp is what it stands for if you read the man file and now we have everything in on one line in a string properly quotated with the quotations around the end there we have backslashes before these quotation marks we have our unicode character now converted to a more uh, 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 compatible format. And then we also have our, all our new line characters. Now, if I was to take this, highlight it, and you'll see, so if we store that somewhere, we pull it out, and then we here we're going to echo it back out. You can see echo will automatically uh, put everything back how it's supposed to be. So that, that's a very usable string there rather than what we had before with all the uniqueness to it. Again, if you want to see more of what these commands, the capital R lowercase s and a do you can look in the man file we do forward slash capital r you can see here this takes the raw input 
uh, and, st and that's going to, again, do the backslashes for us. We have S for slurp, which is going to put everything on one line instead of ring it as, you know, as arrays. And then if we do our dash A here, you can see that it's going to take uh, non-ASCII Unicode uh, code points and convert them to UTF-8, which is just a little more compatible for most systems. So I hope you found that useful. You know, I have found this useful a few times because it used to be when I had uh, things like this, I would try to do it myself. I would try to use SED or TR to go through and oh, find all the quotation marks and backslash them. Uh, and, and you could do that but there's already tools out there. This is just one, I'm sure there's other, but I use JQ for a lot of things because I do a lot of stuff, stuff with JSON and just having this little option here makes it so much easier to just make those strings that I have uh, and make sure that they are compatible uh, with more things. So <laughs> thanks for watching filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with the K. There's a link in the description of my website as well as my Patreon page. On my website, you can search through all my videos uh, as well as... Go to the support section, maybe, and support me. Again, I have LibrePay, PayPal, Patreon. If you can't support me that way, be sure to like, share, subscribe, commenting. And I always just I thank you for watching. I hope that you have a great day. Okay, here I am. I'm going to echo out this multi-line string. Not a problem, right? It does it. Great job. But let's say I wanted to store that string. There's a few things here that might be issues. One, it's multi-line. So we may want to remove those new lines which we could use set or TR to do that, but we also want to preserve those. So if we're going to take this string and put it into a database or a JSON file or some other type of storage, we kind of want it on a, all on one line, but to preserve where the new line characters are. We also have these quotation marks that could be called the cause problems. And I also have a Unicode character here that could cause problems. So how can we easily convert all this? And yeah, you could use said and awk and, and stuff like that, but actually the tool JQ, which is used for parsing through JSON files can actually do this for you. So again, quotation marks, you know, if I wanted to, I could go like this, I could backslash them out and, and that would work, but I would have to do that for each quotation mark. And we may not know the string, we may be pulling data from someplace using a script and we want to automatically put these backslashes in there. And also, again, we want to convert this Unicode character to something a little more compatible. And again, preserve those new line characters. So let's go up to our first example here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pipe this into JQ. Now, JQ may not be installed on your system by default, but will most likely be in your repositories for your uh, Linux system. So go ahead and install that. It's a very useful tool. And what I'm going to say here is if I say dash capital R and then a period, what we're going to do here, what does that do? Well, that automatically went ahead and put backslashes before our quotation marks there. And we'll do it for other characters as well. In certain cases, it will just take care of that for you. You don't have to come up with your own little uh, algorithm to figure that out. Uh, now, we still uh, have everything here with the Unicode character. So what I can add to that is dash A, so lowercase a, so dash R, lowercase a, and now it converted that into a more compatible format for us. But we still have everything as multiple strings. Each line is a new string. We don't want that, so let's go ahead, run the same command. We're gonna add S for slurp, is what it stands for if you read the man file. And now we have everything in on one line, in a string, properly quotated with the quotations around the end there. We have backslashes before these quotation marks. We have our Unicode character now converted to a more uh, 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 compatible format. And then we also have our, all our new line characters. Now, if I was to take this, highlight it, and you'll see. So if we store that somewhere, we pull it out, and then we here we're going to echo it back out. You can see echo will automatically uh, put everything back how it's supposed to be. So that, that's a very usable string there rather than what we had before with all the uniqueness to it. Again, if you want to see more of what these commands, the capital R, lowercase s and a do, you can look in the man file. We do forward slash capital R. You can see here, this takes the raw input uh, and, st and that's going to, again, do the backslashes for us. We have S for slurp, which is going to put everything on one line instead of ring it as, you know, uh, as arrays. And then if we do our dash A here, you can see that it's going to take uh, non-ASCII Unicode uh, code points and convert them to UTF-8, which is just a little more compatible for most systems. So I hope you found that useful. You know, I have found this useful a few times because it used to be when I had uh, things like this, I would try to do it myself. I would try to use said or TR to go through and oh, find all the quotation marks and backslash them. Uh, and, and you could do that, 
but there's already tools out there. This is just one, I'm sure there's other, but I use JQ for a lot of things because I do a lot of stuff, stuff with JSON and just having this little option here makes it so much easier to just make those strings that I have uh, and make sure that they are compatible uh, with more things. So thanks for watching. Filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with the K. There's a link in the description of my website as well as my Patreon page. On my website, you can search through all my videos uh, as well as go to the support section maybe and support me. Again, I have LibrePay, PayPal, Patreon. If you can't support me that way, be sure to like, share, subscribe, commenting. And, and I always just I thank you for watching. I hope that you have a great day.